You're watching CinePolitics with me, Faiza Ahmed. Coming up on this week's show, we revisit a political struggle that took place in 1988 in New Caledonia in Matthew Kasovitz's latest feature film, Rebellion. Now, Kasovitz of Lahaine fame has not only directed the film, but he also stars in the leading role as Captain Philippe Le Gorgeux. Other members of the cast include Malik Zidi, Labé Lepakas and Daniel Martin. So let's set the scene. Now the Canucks are indigenous to the French colony New Caledonia. It's 1988. 30 policemen have been kidnapped by Canuck separatists. Chaos unleashes across the island. Hundreds of French special forces are sent in to try and control the disorder. Now Kasovitz's character, Philippe, captain of the GIGN, is also part of this operation. His mission is to find rebel leader Alphonse, played by Labé Lepakas, and rescue the hostages. Both Philippe and Alphonse want a peaceful solution, but will the two succeed? Or, with the French presidential elections around the corner, will the greater powers have other plans? Let's take a look. Joining us today to discuss Rebellion, we have Ken O'Keefe, an activist, and Dave Calhoun, film critic for Time Out magazine. Welcome to the show, both of you. I have to say, I absolutely loved this film, from the action you know, to the political thriller element. It was very, very powerful, and I really, really enjoyed it. So I want to see if Dave feels the same way about it. Dave, what did you think? I thought it was very successful, actually. I mean, you've got a story here which is going to be you know, unknown to the vast majority of people watching it. It's about you know, a rebellion in 1988 in a French territory, which most audiences will not have heard of, New Caledonian, and specifically the island of Uvea, where the rebellion breaks out. And I think Matthew Kasovitz does a great job of... It's very strong storytelling. I mean, it's an intelligent thriller, but also getting across the details and the background, mm -hmm. the political background to this story as well. He both, he both needs to tell the story of the events going on on the island, but he also needs to give us information to do with what's going on with French politics back home mm -hmm. as well, because this is happening during a uh, presidential election when Mitterrand was standing for re-election against um, uh, Jacques Chirac, who later became president of France. Um, he does it very well. It's got a very strong forward momentum to it as well, and, it, and most importantly, it avoids a lot of cliches you might mm -hmm. expect from an action thriller such as yeah. this. And he has put a lot of material into this. Now, what did you think of the way he shot the film? Uh, I think he's it's shot very impressively. I mean, he what he does is, I mean, he, he makes it it is an action thriller on the surface. There are you know there are scenes of fighting here. There are scenes of hostage situations, as you see in the trailer. There, I mean, there are helicopters flying over the sea, but it's done on a relatively small budget, I think around 10 million euros. Um, yeah, he's spoken of how dollars. the helicopter we see in the film was actually made of wood, and the helicopters we see flying over the sea were all, were all added digitally afterwards. So he manages to... Yeah, I, what, what, he, what he's trying to do here is bring in a mainstream audience to, mm -hmm. quite, to quite a specialist political story. And so the look of the film is accessible. You know, it has the, the veneer of a mainstream film. But I think what's most important is the script doesn't, doesn't avoid good, strong ideas and good, strong debate. No, and I think also, you know, there were certain parts that he shot so well, like the flashbacks that we saw. And, you know, I thought, wow, you know, it's done really well. And the music, it really went with the story. And I was actually 
I can say, for the first time this year on the edge of my seat with an action film. I really, really like that part. The flashback scene, actually, is a, bit, it's a particularly good one. When someone's recounting how this military base was taken over by local rebels, and we're, we're in the military base in the moment, you know, the rebellion having happened, but we see the rebellion happening around yeah. the characters now. It's a really strong director's flourish, that. Exactly. Yeah. Ken, what did you think of this film? Well, the first thing that I really appreciated about the film is that it's not a Hollywood production because I can imagine how this story would have been told if it had been produced in Hollywood. Um, having lived in Hawaii and spent a lot of time understanding the impact of the occupation which is ongoing in Hawaii and the effects of colonization on the Hawaiian Islands, I can really relate to the feelings of the characters in this film um, who yearn, the Kanaks who yearn for real independence. The way this film portrayed them, although very accurate, I'd say, probably in the kind of anger, righteous anger that they feel towards the French colonizers, um, it humanizes them in a way yeah. that I think is fair. And, and, and it, it doesn't do it in a trite kind of way where it overly, you know, cliches these It was these done with a lot of dignity, and I think, you know, when he kind of said, you know, their fathers, their sons, and you can almost kind of connect with them on that level. Yeah. But we're going to pause there. Let's go to our next clip. Now, I had the opportunity to meet director Matthew Kasovitz, and let's see what he had to say, and then we'll see another scene from the film. Thank you for joining us today. Um, can you tell me why you felt it was so important to make Rebellion today? It was important for the story not to be forgotten. And actually, not a lot of people knew about it, so uh, of the true story. We heard about um, uh, an official story when it happened. That story happened in 1988. And we heard the official story from the government. But then I discovered that there were another story, a, a different reality to it. And I thought it was important to, you know, movies are memories. Uh, once they're done, they're going to stay. So it's, it's important to, it was important not, you know, for that story not to be forgotten and to make a movie about it. I think so. Now, following, obviously, the film's release, there was some controversy you know, with certain French politicians, um, even some Canucks, and uh, the cinema owner in New Caledonia. I mean, why do you think that was the case? You know, it's not a controversial movie. It's a movie that is as close to reality as possible, but it exposes a lie. And the people who were participating in that lie at many levels, for good or wrong, are still there today. So, of course, when you make a movie like that and you're trying to expose that, that lie and tell the truth, it becomes controversial for them. So they say it's controversial, but it's not. You know, it would be controversial if, 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 my, if the movie I did was not the truth and I was trying to lie and tell a lie or tell a, a different story, but it's not the, the case. You know, when you're trying, it's very easy for people to dismiss it by saying it's controversial when you're just trying to expose them. <laughs> OK, so there was some controversy surrounding the release of this film by both, you know, the Canucks and... Uh, and I think that was more to do with the fact that it was told maybe from Philippe's perspective and obviously with the French politicians. Do you agree with what Matthew said as to why... Well, I, I think, for instance, one of the very important facts that's revealed in that film is the extrajudicial killing of uh, some of the Canucks at the end. After the French have taken control of them, they're completely subdued. There's a clear scene where one of them is shot right in the back mm -hmm. by a French soldier. That's important, and, and that, has to, that kind of fact has to be realized, and we really need to soak up, especially those of us who come from colonial countries, these realities. So I will certainly agree with him on that level, mm -hmm. and there are other nuanced levels of the film as well where clearly those who are part of the power structure who have an inherent stake in maintaining the status quo and the, in the position of power, clearly they wouldn't like the film, and I think that's probably the element that considered it controversial. So I think that's a fair statement from him. Okay, so let's, let's just set the scene. For people who might not know the history, you know, what happened in New Caledonia, how did the French end up there, and why do they, you know, not want to decolonize this land? Well, it's the same old story told over and over again. I mean, Captain Cook came there back in the late 1700s, just like he did Hawaii. And within 100 years, uh, a large portion of the population was decimated by disease. And this was not an accident. We knew that these uh, diseases had a terrible impact on Polynesian cultures. And, and it was devastating to both the New Caledonians, the Kaks, 
and also the Hawaiians and many other Pacific Islanders. So the first thing was the decimation of the population through disease. Next come in the landowners. The French came in and all the best lands eventually get taken over through one con or another. This is some of their tribal lands, you know, some sacred places yeah. to this indigenous group. It's always the same thing. First they take the land. Of course, later on nickel was found and this is a very important element and it gives Caledonia a real price tag value for French colonialists. So of course there's a real interest in stake in maintaining control of those, uh, of those elements to be able to maintain the benefit of, of the profit that can be made. All the while, the people themselves who come from these lands derive no real benefit from these elements and ultimately they get disenfranchised, dispossessed of their land. And this is the same old pattern over and over. Now, Dave, one of the um, actors who plays Alphonse, L'Abbé Lepacus, he's actually a Kanak, and he turned out that he was a relative of the real-life Alphonse, which is really interesting. Mm. What did you think of his performance? Because he's a first-time actor. Uh, I thought it was very strong, actually. Um, and I think the interesting background to, the, to, to his casting, and a lot of the casting in the film, is that Matthew Kasovitz spent a long time finding... Kanaks or people of you know Kanak origin to play characters such as Alphonse as well because he he really felt that if you cast if you didn't cast from the culture that was being depicted there would be a big hole of, of truth in the, mm. in the in the heart of the movie and you can feel that I think you can feel that you can feel it not only in the way the lines are spoken but you can feel it in the body language you can feel it in the communication between um, the character played by Alphonse Dianu and Matthew, Car Matthew yeah. Kasovitz's character as well, you know, as the, the head of the SWAT team coming in to try and negotiate this hostage situation. So I think it's, and apparently it's something that Matthew Kasovitz, it took a lot of time to get mm -hmm. that right and to find the right actor. I think film, it really pays off. There's just a sense of truth. It's hard to explain exactly why, but there's a sense of truth to it. Definitely, and this film did take you know, a long time to get made just due to these special details that he paid a lot of attention to. Let's pause there. Let's go to our next clip and hear a little bit more from Matthew. And um, why did you choose to tell it from Philippe's perspective? Because Philippe Le Gorgeau is... So Philippe Le Gorgeau is the captain of uh, that elite SWAT team who are very responsible and very uh, uh, dedicated to save lives. Even they, they, they try not to hurt the people they fight against. Uh, so. They're very uh, ethical and 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 uh, you know intelligent people, and uh, he got in the middle of a, a political fight and uh, a human uh, tragedy, and he had to take decisions that were against his own morality, and so it 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 was there. He was there. It was when you read the books about the story about you know uh, the investigations that were made from journalists. He was there all the time, so he became that axis of of the axle of of you know of uh, for him to be the eyes and follow everything. So we, the audience, can be in issues and and figure out what we do, would have done if we were in his shoes, for real. So that's why the character is not very important, but it's, it allows the audience to uh, see everything through his eyes. Up until the end, I couldn't work out what he was going to do, and I was on edge, so, you know, with Philippe. Well, how do you want the audience to perceive him? Exactly like that. No, to perceive him. I, I don't want the audience to perceive him in any way. He's, you know, his, his, his personal story is not that important, and, and Philippe Le Gorgé will tell you that also. He will tell you that his personal story is not that important, but what he witnessed was uh, uh, not only a tragedy, but also uh, an explanation of how the system works and how the, you know, uh, uh, how the system is rigged. So. What I want people to understand is it's not how he felt, it's how you felt if you were in issues again and if you, if you had to make decisions like that. And you have to make decisions like that. You don't want to judge him. You need to judge the system around him. You know, don't, don't, it's, not about, it's not about his problems. And actually, while you were wondering what he would, he would do, you, were ask, you would ask yourself, what would I do, right? Okay, so Philippe Le Gorgeux. Now, say if he had gone against his superiors, I don't know how likely that would have been, what would have been the consequences? And I mean, would that have been possible? Well, it would have been rather devastating for the political leadership at the time to be exposed for basically sacrificing their own people and, and effectively or authorizing a bloodbath. It would have been very, very destructive, and uh, you know, and to me, that's one of the key issues that this film really does bring to light. And I think as we see this world moving more and more towards an illusion of democracy, with in truth uh, concentration of power even further. And in America right now, 
The president on a weekly basis has meetings to authorize extrajudicial killings of even American citizens around the world. We live in a world where power is being abused on the most obscene levels and those that follow the orders of these obscene uh, abuses of power really need to think hard about what they're doing and I believe and personally if we're to move into a better world we must take accountability for our own actions. We can't hide behind the system and simply do what we're told. At a certain point we've got to do what's right. Not just what's right for us but what's right period. And I think that's one of the mm -hmm. key elements of this film that I really do appreciate. I went through mixed emotions I'd say when you know when I was looking at Philippe's character. How did you both respond to him? Um, I, I think dramatically he's a great character actually for well, as Matthew Kasovic explains there in one he his eyes are on so many elements of this story, so, so he takes us into the, the hostage situation, he takes us into the minister's office, you know, he takes us into, the, arm, in, into the, the head of the army. So in terms of a perspective on this story, it's a very strong one because it, he, he's dealing with all those elements mm -hmm. of all those various characters within it. But morally he's fascinating as well because he, he's very much... A, it, I hesitate to call him a hero, but he's certainly come out of it thinking he's a flawed hero. He's someone yeah, who he's very complex. is trying to do right, but when it comes to it, you know, he's betrayed by his by his superiors, they don't, they don't stick to their word. You know, a bloodbath ensues, as you say. But what's interesting is we don't then see him, uh, we don't really get his reaction, to be honest. I mean, he's a pragmatist. I mean, he's, you know, he does have to obey orders. He does, in the end, have to just go along with what's happened there. And then in the moment, go along with the events that have occurred because of decisions taken above him. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, that, I mean, that, that, and the interesting thing is there is that it doesn't, that makes, that limits the responsibility that he has to the events that we see there as well. And it makes us think of the bigger system, you know, of which he's mm -hmm. only a small part. Mm. Now, Ken, I think at the time, the Canucks, obviously, you know, the French had a socialist president. They had a lot of faith in him. I think they thought he may do the right thing by them. That didn't really happen. I mean, the referendum's around the corner. Again, there's a socialist president in power. What are your thoughts? Well, the, the path to freedom and uh, decolonization is, is generally not a, a very pleasant one and oftentimes bloody, and, and the, the Canucks have, have dealt with uh, huge injustices for, well, you know, 200 years now plus. And ultimately, um, I have to say, you know, I, I've had a recent conversation with a high school friend of mine in which he said, you know, if America hadn't taken over uh, Hawaii, a worse, a worse nation would have. Well, in truth, actually, we can look and see that the New Caledonian people, the Canucks, actually have a real opportunity, it looks, to have full and complete independence, which I believe in 100%. Mm -hmm. And that brings in issues, other issues in the film, which we don't get into detail, and I don't think there was room for it, but you know, the issue of who actually gets to decide that. Do settlers get to decide that? Do the settlers in Palestine get to decide? what is the political reality of, of the nation and ultimately the future of the nation. Well, we'll come back and talk more about that in the next section. Let's go to our final clip from the film. I want them to remember about the, that community and that, that, that different civilization from ours where people think differently and they have a different interaction with each other and different interaction with nature, with life, with... Uh, the elements. And obviously the referendum is around the corner, but it keeps getting delayed. Do you think that this community, you know, the Kanak, should get their independence? I am, I, it's not for me to say, but if they want their independence, they're going to vote for it and they should get it. Uh, I don't know what is the best thing for them. And uh, it's, you know, it's a very complicated situation. But independence is mandatory everywhere in the world for everybody. So, you know, colonies are not relevant and not, uh, anymore and we should you know they have the opportunity to get it so let's hope they, they let's hope it's going to work out so ken under the uh, occupation of the french how what kind of treatment has been afforded to the canucks really again it's the same pattern you know you bring in the missionaries oftentimes and they teach you that your customs are hedonistic and uh, inferior and that they must be abandoned that you must adopt the culture of the oppressor, the colonizer, um, laws are passed which make your own customs illegal. This again, this has happened. So I think in the film, Alphonse basically did say at one point that they, you know, they didn't want to have this hostage situation. They were only trying to defend their um, culture, which mm. they felt was under threat. Well, their land, their use of land was like the first thing, really, that the, the, the way that they had used this land for, for you know, generation after generation was basically uh, completely destroyed by the French concept of ownership 
and ultimately their acquisition of these lands, which is through the same old corrupt means. That a Kanak uh, without land is, is not a Kanak, as one of their mm -hmm. leaders said. You know, you take the land away from any people, you dispossess them of the land, you're going to have deeply emotional scars that are going to continue to live on until those people are able to retain what is rightfully theirs. Every person has a right to the land of which they were born and which the generations before them came. And ultimately, that's the struggle, and that's mm -hmm. what this is about. Now, the current president of New Caledonia, Harold Martin, I think he wants a, another accord to delay the referendum. Um, but do you think the referendum is a vehicle to create significant political change in New Caledonia? It may be. I'd have to, I'd have to say it would be wrong of me to, to make an absolute uh, prediction as to what will happen in this regard. But what I do know historically is that referendums um, from imperial colonialist uh, nations are generally an attempt to maintain the status quo. So the pattern doesn't look good. But from what I can understand of, of what's going on with the referendum, the New Caledonians, the Canucks, do actually have a real chance. But of course, they're going to be outspent. Because uh, I wonder how many of them will actually be able to vote. Well, that's, that's what I want to know. That's another issue. Again, should the uh, settlers of Palestine be allowed to vote for the future of Palestine? Should the settlers of Hawaii, uh, American citizens, be allowed to vote for the future of the Kanaka Maoli? Um, I don't think that's correct. I don't mm -hmm. care if we've lived there for one generation or two. I think it's only fair that we take uh, an honest look at what we've done. You know, the impact of our colonization and settlements over these uh, centuries has been truly destructive. We've decimated and virtually destroyed many a civilization mm -hmm. in the process of doing this. If we want to have any kind of healing, any justice in this world, we have to pay some amends and be okay. honest with what we've mm -hmm. done. Now, Dave, this is obviously a foreign language film. What kind of audience do you think it's going to attract? Um, it's interesting because it's outside of France, it's, uh, it's the, the, the appeal of it is going to be limited because audience, only a certain percentage of film audiences like to watch foreign language films. That's the truth. That said, this is a more, you know, compared to some of the more art house foreign language films that are released in the UK or anywhere else outside of France, this is definitely more of a mainstream offering. And interestingly, certainly the people selling the film, the distributor, mm -hmm. if you look at the poster, there's an explosion. If you look at the main trailer, there's no, there's no French mm -hmm. language in it. They're trying to attract a, more po a, a wider audience than, than a French release normally would. But I think actually, when it comes down to it, it's really, it's going to be an engaged audience. It's going to be an mm -hmm. audience who's interested in the politics. Well, I do that. hope that, you know, a lot of people do get to see this film because it's definitely one must see this month. If you're going out, please do watch Rebellion. It's definitely worth it. Thank you to both my guests and, of course, to all of you at home. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do so by emailing us at cinepolitics at presstv.co.uk or you can join our Facebook fan page. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Thank you.